Christ, the Ideal of the Monk by Dom Columba Marmion One General View of the Monastic Institution When we examine the rule of St. Benedict, we see very clearly that he presents it only as an abridgment of Christianity and a means of practicing the Christian life in its fullness and perfection. We find the great patriarch declaring from the first lines of the prologue of his rule that he only addresses those who wish to return to God under Christ's leadership. And in the end, the monastic code, he declares that he proposes the accomplishment of this view to whomsoever through his help of Christ, hastened to the heavenly country. Quisquis ergo ad patrium celestem festinas hanc regulam descriptam ad giovante Cristo perfice. To his mind, the rule is but a simple and very safe guide for leading to God. In writing it, St. Benedict does not wish to institute anything beyond or beside the Christian life. He does not assign to his monks any special work as a particular end to be pursued. The end is, as he says, to seek God. Si rivera quertuit Deum. And this is what he requires, before all, of those who come to knock at the door of the monastery, to be there received as monks. In this disposition he resumes all the others it gives, as it were, the key to all his teaching, and determines the mode of life he wishes to see, led by his sons. This is the end that he proposes, and this is why we ought always to have this end before our eyes, to examine it frequently, and above all only to act in your view of it. You know that every man, as a free and reasonable creature, asks from some deliberate motive. Let us imagine ourselves in a great city like London, at certain hours of the day the streets are thronged with people. It is like a moving army. It is the ebb and flow of a human sea. Men are coming and going, elbowing their way, passing to and fro. And all this rapidity, for time is money, almost without exchanging any signs amongst themselves, each one of these innumerable beings is independent of the others, and has his own particular end in view. Quid querunt? That they are seeking, these thousands and thousands of men who are hurrying to the city, why are they in such haste? Some are in search of pleasure, others pursue honors. These are urged by the fever of ambition, those by the thirst of gold. The greater number are in the quest of daily bread. From time to time a lady goes to visit the poor. A sister of charity seeks Jesus Christ in the person of the sick. Unnoticed, a priest passes by, the picks hidden upon his breast, as he carries the viaticum to the dying. But out of this immense crowd, pursuing created things, only a very small number are working for God alone. And yet, the influence of the motive is predominant in the value of our actions. See these two men who are embarking together for a far-off destination. Both leave country, friends, family, and landing on a foreign shore, they penetrate into the interior of the country, 
exposed to the same dangers. They cross the same rivers and the same mountains. The sacrifices they impose on themselves are the same. But the one is a merchant urged on by the greed of gold, and the other is an apostle seeking souls. And this is why, although the human eye can scarcely discern the difference, an abyss which God alone can measure separates the lives of these two men. This abyss has been created by the motive, give a cup of water to a beggar, a coin to a poor man, or if you do so in the name of Jesus Christ, that is to say from the supernatural motive of grace. And this is why, although the human eye can scarcely discern the difference, an abyss which God alone can measure separates the lives of these two men. This abyss has been created by the motive, give a cup of water to a beggar, a coin to a poor man. If you do so in the name of Jesus Christ, that is to say from a supernatural motive of grace, because in this poor man you see Christ who said, as long as you did it to one of these my least brethren, you did it to me. Your action is pleasing to God, and this cup of water, which is nothing, this small coin, will not remain without a reward. But pour out handfuls of gold into the hands of this poor man in order to pervert him. On this account alone, your action becomes abominable. Thus, when the motive from which we act the life that we pursue, and that which were to direct our whole life, is for us of capital importance. Never forget this. A man is worth that which he seeks, that which he is attached. Are you seeking God? Are you tending towards him with all the fervor of your soul? However little removed you may be from the nothingness of your condition of creature, you raise yourself because you because you unite yourself to the indefin, infinitely perfect being. Are you seeking the creature, gold, pleasures, honors, satisfaction and pride? That is to say your yourself comes all these forms? Then, however great you may be in the sight of men, you are just worth about as much as this creature, you lower yourself to its level. And the baser it is, the more you debase yourself. A poor sister of charity, a simple lay brother, who, seeking God, spent their lives in humble and obscure labors in order to accomplish the divine will, are incomparably greater in the sight of God whose judgment alone matters, for he is eternal, than a man who has heaped up riches, or is surrounded with honors, or lit lives only for pleasures. Yes, a man is worth what he seeks. This is why St. Benedict, who shows us the adepts of the cenobitical life, as the most strong race. Cenobatarum fortissimum genus requires no supernatural or perfect motive from one who wishes to embrace this career. The motive and ambition of possessing God. Si rivera deum querit but, as you say, what is it to seek God? And by such means are we to find him. For it is needful to seek in such a way that we may find. To seek God constitutes the whole program. To find God remains habitually united to him by the bonds of faith and love. In this lies all perfection. Let us see what it is to seek God. 
let us consider the conditions of this seeking. We shall next see the fruits that brings it on whomsoever applies himself to it. We shall have pointed out the same time with the end that we pursue, the path that will lead us to perfection and beatitude. For if we truly seek him, nothing will prevent us from finding him, and in him we shall produce all good. one we must seek god but is god in some place where he must be sought is he not everywhere assuredly as we know god is in every being by his presence by his power and by his essence in god this operation is not separated from the active virtue which it is derived and the power is identical with this essence. In every being, God operates by sustaining it in existence. In this manner, God is in every creature, for all exist and continue to exist only by an effect of the divine action that supposes God's intimate motive. But reasonable beings can, moreover, know and love God, and thus possess Him in themselves. However, this kind of eminence was not sufficient for God as regards us. There is a more intimate and elevated degree of union. God does not content Himself with being the object of a natural knowledge and love on man's part, but he calls us to share his very life and his own beatitude. By a movement of infinite love towards us, God wishes to be for our souls not only the sovereign master of all things, but as a friend, a father. It is his will that we should know him as he knows himself the source of all truth and of all beauty. It is his will that we should possess him, the infinite good, and here below in the dimness of faith, and above it in the light of glory. To this end, as you know, he raises our nature above itself by adorning it with sanctifying grace, infused virtues, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. God wills, by the communication of his infinite and eternal life, to be himself our perfect beatitude. He does not wish us to find our happiness apart from himself, the plenitude of all good. He leaves no creature the power of satisfying our heart. Ego merces tua magnum nimis. It is I myself who am thy reward exceedingly great. And our Lord confirmed his promise back when about to pay the price thereof for the sacrifice of his precious blood. Father, I will that I am here, whom they also whom thou hast given me may be with me, they may see my glory, that the love where which thou hast loved me may be in them. Such is the unique and supreme end to which we must tend. We have to seek God, not only the God of nature, but a God of revelation. For us, Christians, then, to seek God is to tend towards Him, not only as simple creatures who move towards the first principle and last end of their being, but supernaturally, that is to say, as children who wish to remain united to their Father with all their strength of will, urged by love, and through that mysterious participation in the very nature of God of which St. Peter speaks. 
It is to have and to cultivate with the divine persons an intimacy so real and so profound that St. John calls it fellowship with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ, in their common spirit. It is to this psalmist alludes when he exhorts us to seek the face of God. That is to say, to seek the friendship of God, to seek his love, as when the bride looking upon the bridegroom seeks to behold in the eyes of the depth of his soul telling her of his tenderness, God is to us a father full of goodness. He wills that even here below we should find our happiness in him, in his ineffable perfections. St. Benedict had no other views for his disciples. From the first lines of the prologue he warns us not to grieve by his evil deeds, the God who has vouchsafed to count us among his children. To attain to God, this is the end that St. Benedict wishes us to have before our eyes. This principle, like a life-giving sap, circulates through all the articles of the monastic code. We have not come to the monastery, then, in order to devote ourselves to science, nor the arts, nor the work of education. It is true that the great patriarch wishes us at all times to serve God with the good, good things. He has given us, he wishes the house of God to be wisely governed by prudent men. Doubtless this recommendation primarily foresees the material organization, but it can be equally applied to the moral and intellectual life of the monastery. St. Benedict does not wish the talents given by God to remain hidden. He permits the cultivation of the arts, a constant tradition which he ought humbly to respect, has in the same way sufficiently established for monks the legitimacy of studies and apostolic labors. And the abbot, the head of the monastery, will certainly have it at heart to preserve the diverse manifestations of monastic activity. He will endeavor to develop for the common good for the service of the church and for the salvation of souls and for God's glory, the various aptitude that he finds in each one of his monks. But once again, the end does not lie in this. All these works are only means in view of an end. The end is higher. It is in God. It is God sought for himself as the supreme beatitude. Thus, as we see later, divine worship itself neither constitutes nor can constitute the direct end that the monastic institution established by the rule wills to attain. Saint Benedict will have us seek God, seek him for his own glory, because we love him above all things seek him for his own glory because we love him above all things he would have us seek to unite ourselves to him by charity there is is not for any of us any other end or of any other perfection the worship of God proceeds from the virtue of religion doubtless the highest of the moral virtues and it is united to the virtue of justice. But it is not a theo theological virtue. The infused theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity, are the specific virtues of our state as children of God. Properly speaking, the supernatural life is based here, below, on these three virtues. They regard God directly inasmuch as he is the author of the supernatural order. Faith is like the root 
hope the stalk, and charity at once the flower and the fruit of the supernatural life. Now, it is this charity whereby we are and remain truly united to God that constitutes the end assigned by St. Benedict and the very essence of perfection. Si revera deum querit. This end establishes the true greatness of the monastic life. It also establishes the true reason of its existence. In the opinion of Pseudo-Dionysus the Arapagite, we are given the name of monks alone, one, on account of the, this life of indivisible unity, whereby withdrawing our mind from the distractions of manifold things, we hasten towards divine unity and towards the perfection of holy love. 2. The ambition of possessing God, such is the primal disposition that St. Benedict requires of the postulant who presents himself at the door of the monastery. He seeks in this a proof of sure vocation, but this disposition must extend to the monk's whole life. For the abbot himself, the great patriarch wishes that first and foremost he should seek the kingdom of God. In charity, as Christ commanded, that he should have care above all to establish this kingdom in the souls instructed, entrusted to him. All material activity exerted in the monastery ought to have this but one end in view, that in all things God may be glorified. For in all things love refers everything to his glory. Let us carefully notice these words. In all things, in omnibus. This is one of the conditions of our seeking God. In order for it to be true, as St. Benedict requires, our seeking after God must be constant. He must seek his face everywhere. Quiereti facium ejus semper. You might say, but do not possess God from the time of our baptism. And as long as we are in procession of sanctifying grace, undoubtedly, then why seek God if we possess him already? To seek God is to remain united to him by faith. It is to attach ourselves to him as the object of our prayer. Now we know that this union of faith and love admits of a very vast number of degrees. God is everywhere present, says St. Ambrose, but he is nearest to those who love him. He dwells far from those who neglect his service. Dominus ubique semper est, sed est presentor diligentibus negligentibus abest. When we have found God, we can still seek Him, that is to say, we can always draw nearer to God, by an ever intenser faith, an ever more fervent love, an ever more faithful accomplishment of his will. And this is why we can and ought always to seek God. Until the day when he will give himself to us in an inadmissible manner, in the glorious splendor of his indefectible light, if we do not attain this end, we shall remain useless and unprofitable. The psalmist says, and St. Benedict quotes these words in the prologue in commenting upon them, that the Lord hath hooked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any that understand and seek God. They are all gone aside, for they have become unprofitable together. 
How many men, indeed, do not understand that God is the source of all good and the supreme end of every creature? These men have turned aside from the road that leads to the end. They have become unprofitable. Why is this? What is a useless being? It is one that does not correspond to the end for which it was created. For instance, in order to fulfill the end for which it is purchased, a watch must show the time. It may well be of gold, studded with diamonds, encrusted with precious stones, but unless it keeps time it is useless. We too become useless beings if we do not tend unceasingly to the end for which we came to the monastery. Now this end is to seek God, to refer all to him and to our supreme end, to place in him our sole beatitude, in the rest is vanity of vanities. We do not act thus, we are useless. It is in vain that we spend ourselves, even though this spending of ourselves would appear remarkable in the eyes of the world. In God's sight, it would be that of profitless beings, who do not fulfill the conditions required by their existence, and have lost sight of the end to which their vocations predestined them. How terrible! is the uselessness of a human life. How much there is that is useless sometimes in our life, even our religious life, because God is absent from our actions. Do not let us, then, be of those foolish people of which Scripture speaks, who are stayed by vain and passing trifles. Let us be attentive to seek God in all things, in the superiors, in our brethren, in all the creatures, in the events of life, in the midst of contradiction as in hours of joy. Let us seek him always, so that we may be able unceasingly to put our lips to the source of beatitude. We can always drink from it without fear of seeing the waters exhausted, for, says St. Augustine, their abundance surpasses our need. Fons vincent silentium. It is of them that Jesus Christ said that they become in the soul a fountain of water springing up into life everlasting. 3. Another condition of the sincerity of our seeking is that to be exclusive. Let us seek God solely. I look upon this condition as capital. To seek God solely, that is without doubt, is the same as trying to seek God himself. Notice the term God, not the gifts of God, although they may help us remain faithful, nor his consolations, though God wills that we taste the sweetness of his service, but we ought to not stop at these gifts nor be attached to these consolations. It is for God himself that we have come to the monastery. Our seeking will then be true, as St. Benedict wishes it to be, and only will be pleasing to God if we are attaching to nothing apart from God. When we seek the creature, when we are attached to it, it is as if we said to God, My God, I do not find all in Thee. There are so many souls who have need of something with God, of something more than God. God is not all for them. They cannot, like the saint of Assisi, look at God and say to him, with all the truth of their being, My God and my all. They cannot repeat after St. Paul, 
I count all things that but to be but loss for the excellent knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord from whom I have suffered the loss of all things count them as dung that I may gain Christ never forget this extremely important truth as long as we experience the need of a creature and are attached to it we cannot say that we seek God solely and God will not give himself entirely to us it is if our will that our search be sincere if we want to find God fully we must detach ourselves from all that is not God and would shackle us in the operation of his grace this is the doctrine of the Saints listen to what st. Catherine of Siena said on her deathbed feeling her end approaching she gathered her spiritual family around her and gave them her last instructions which have been collected by her confessor the blessed Raymond of Capua her first and fundamental teaching was that he who enters into the service of God ought necessarily if he truly wishes to possess God to root out from his heart all sensible affection not only for persons but moreover any other creature whatever and tend towards his divine creature creator in the simplicity of an undivided love for the heart cannot be given entirely to God if it is not free from all other love and if it does not open itself to thee with a frankness exclusive of all reserve st. Teresa speaking from the same experience says we are so miserly so slow in giving ourselves to God that we never finish putting ourselves into the necessary dispositions and yet our Lord will not allow us to enter into the enjoyment of so precious a treasure the perfect possession of God without paying a high price for it I see clearly that there is nothing upon earth wherewith can be purchased however the saint adds if we did that all depends upon ourselves so as not to cling to anything earthly if our conversation and all our thoughts were in heaven such a treasure I am convinced would be granted to us the saint next shows by some examples how it often happens that we give ourselves to God entirely but afterwards take back little by little what we have given and she concludes a nice way forsooth to seek the love of God we must have it at one, have it at once and in handfuls as the saying is but on condition of retaining our affections to take possession of it we do not make any effort to fulfill our good desires we allow them to drag miserably upon the earth and with all this we must moreover have many spiritual consolations truly they will not be granted to us in my opinion these two things are quite incompatible therefore it is because our gift is not entire that we do not receive without delay the treasure of divine love it is to find God to please him alone that after the example of the great patriarch we have left all sole dio placeres desiderans says saint gregory we must always remain in the fundamental disposition it is only at this price that we shall find God if on the contrary forgetting little by little our initial gift we allow ourselves to turn aside from this supreme aim if we cling to some person some employment 
some charge, some work or op occupation, some object then, let us be convinced of all this. We shall never possess God fully. Oh, if we could say, and say in all truth, what the Apostle Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and it will be enough for us. But in order to be able to say this in truth, we must also be able to say with the Apostles, Lord, we have left all things and followed thee. Happy are they who carry out this desire to its end, to extreme, actual and perfect renunciation. But let them not say, This trifle to which I cling is nothing. Do you not know the nature of the human heart? However little we leave to it, it will not be content till it has obtained all its desire. Tear all away, break all asunder, hold to nothing. Happy indeed are they who it is given to carry out this desire to the end, to pursue it even to attainment. If we seek God in spite of every trial, if, every, if each day, each hour, we gave him this homage, so extremely pleasing to him, which consists of placing him and him alone, our beatitude. But if we never seek anything but his will, if we act in such a way that his good pleasure is the true motive, power beyond of all our activity, God will never fail us. God is faithful. He cannot forsake those who seek him. He, the nearer we approach him by faith, confidence, and love, the nearer we approach our perfection. As God is the principal author of our holiness, since it is supernatural, to draw near to him, to remain united to him by charity, constitutes the very condition of our perfection. The more we set ourselves free from all sin, from the all imperfection, from all creatures, from all human beings of action, in order to think only of him, to seek only his good pleasure, the more, too, will life abound in us, and God will fill us with himself. Quirait Deum, es vivil anima vestra. There are souls who so sincerely seek God that they are wholly possessed by Him, and no longer know how to live without Him. I declare to you, a holy Benedictine nun, the blessed Bonomo, wrote to her father, That is not I that live, but another in me who has entire possessions of me. He is my absolute master. O oh God, I know how not to drive him from me. When the soul is thus wholly given to God, and God also gives himself to the soul, he takes a particular care for her. One might at times say that for such a soul God forgets the rest of the universe. Look at St. Gertrude. Y you know what a special love our Lord manifested towards her. He declared that she had not then upon the earth any creature towards whom he stooped with more delight, to the point that he added he would always come he would always be found in the heart of Gertrude, whose least desires he loved to fulfill. One who knew of this great intimacy dared to ask our Lord what were the attractions whereby St. Gertrude had merited a like preference. I love her in this way, replied our Lord on account of her liberty of heart, wherein nothing enters that can dispute the sovereignty with me. 
Thus, because, entirely detached from every creature, she sought God only in all things, this saint merited to be the object of divine light, truly ineffable and extraordinary. Let us then seek God always and in all. After the example of this great soul, herself a worthy daughter of the great patriarch, let us seek him sincerely from the depth of our hearts. Let us often say to him like the psalmist, Thy face, O Lord, will I seek. Faciem tuam, domini vecuririum. For what I have in heaven, and besides thee, what do I desire upon earth? Thou art the God of my heart, and the God that is my portion for ever. My God, thou art so great, so beautiful, so good, that, as thou knowest, thou dost fully suffice me. Let others cling to human love. Not only dost thou permit it, but thy providence had established that it would be so. In the mission of preparing the elect for thy kingdom is a great and high mission. Thy apostle says, Sacramentum hoc magnum est. Thou givest abundant blessings to those who observe thy law in this state. As for me, I want thee alone so that my heart may be undivided and solicitous only to the interests of thy glory and may leave to thee without impediment. When and when created things present themselves to us, let us say inwardly, Depart from me, for thou art the prey of death. If we act in this way, we shall find God and with him all good things. Seek me, he says himself to the soul, with that simplicity of heart which is born of sincerity, for I am found by them that tempt me not, and show myself to them that have faith in me. In finding God we shall likewise possess joy. We were made to be happy. The human heart has a capacity for the infinite. Only God can truly sanctify, satisfy us. Thou didst make us for thyself, O Lord. And our heart is restless until it finds rest in thee. Fecheste nos ad te, et inquietum est cor nostrum. Donec resequat in ti. This is why, when we seek anything apart from God or His holy will, we do not find stable and perfect happiness. It may be said that in any other numerous religious community, different categories of souls are to be met with. You will see some living in continual gladness. Their in inward joy radiates outwardly. I am not now speaking of that sensible joy which often depends on the temperament, the state of health, or the circumstances dependent on the will but of joy abiding in the depth of the soul which is like a foretaste of heavenly bliss. Have these souls then never had any trial? They have no conflicts to sustain, nor contradictions to undergo. Certainly they have, for each disciple of Jesus Christ to carry his cross. But the fervor of grace and divine unction make them endure these sufferings joyfully. Other souls do not feel this gladness. Inwardly, and often outwardly, they are troubled, distressed, unhappy. 
Whence comes this difference? Because the first seek God in all things, and seeking him alone they find him everywhere, and with him supreme good and unchanging bliss. Bonus est dominus anime querente ilium. The others are either attached to created things or seek themselves by egotism, self-love, levity, and it is themselves, too, that they find themselves. That is to say, nothingness. And this cannot content them, for the soul created for God thirsts after the perfect good. What fills your mind? Where your thoughts naturally turn? There is your treasure, there is your heart. If it is God, you will be happy. If it is anything mortal, unceasingly consumed by rust, corruption, mortality, your treasure will escape you and your heart will remain poor and arid. When a man of the world tires of his own hearth, he forgets his boredom by seeking distractions outside. He goes to his club, or he travels. But the religious has not yet these resources. He has to say, in the monastery, where the regular life with its successive exercises, for which the bell inexorably rings, it is interrupted by those natural distractions which people in the world may lawfully seek. With souls for whom God is not all, weariness slips in to the monotony inherent to all re regular life. And when the monk does not find God, because he does not seek God, he is very near estimating the burden he has to carry is too heavy. He could, doubtless, become absorbed in an occupation, forget himself in his work, says Blosius. This is an insuff insufficient and illusory diversion. Why is this? Because especially in the monastery there are always hours when a man has to come face to face with himself, that is not to say with his own nothingness. The soul in its depths does not taste that transporting joy. It does not experience that deep and peaceful fervor which is given by the intimate nearness of God. It does not go straight to God. It hovers unceasingly around him without ever finding him perfectly. When the soul seeks God and seeks him alone, when it tends towards him with all his energies, when it clings to no created thing, God fills it with joy, and with that overflowing joy of which St. Benedict speaks when he says that in the measure wherein faith, and with it hope and love increase in the soul of the monk, he runs with heart enlarged and unspeakable sweetness of love in the way of God's commandments. Let us then often repeat like that great monk St. Bernard, Ad quid venisti? Wherefore have I come? Why have I left the world? Why have I separated myself from those who are dear to me? Why have I renounced my liberty? Why have I made so many and such great sacrifices? Did I come to give myself up to intellectual labors? to gain knowledge, to occupy myself with the arts or with teaching? No, we came, never let us forget this, for one thing and one thing only, 
to seek God. It was to win this one precious pearl of the possession of God that we renounced everything. We should examine ourselves to see what degree we seek God, to what point we are detached from the creature. If we are loyal, God will show us what there is in us that hinders us from going to God with all our heart. Our end in our glory is to seek God, and it is very high vocation that belonging to the race of those who seek God. Hac est generatio querentium eum. In choosing the one thing necessary, we have chosen the better part. Hereditas mia preclara est mihi. Let us remain faithful to the sublime vocation. We shall not yet arrive at the realization of our ideal in a day, nor yet in a year. We shall not arrive at it without difficulty or without sufferings, for that purity of affection, that absolute detachment, full and constant, which God requires of us before giving himself entirely to us, is only gained by much generosity. But if we have decided to give ourselves completely to God, without reservation, and never to bargain with him for the least corner of our heart, to admit no attachment, however slight it may be to any creature, let us be assured that God will reward our efforts by the perfect possession of himself, wherein we shall find all our beatitude. With what mercy God treats a soul, says St. Teresa, when he bestow, bestows upon her grace and courage to devote herself generously and with all her might to the pursuit of such a good. But let her, let her but persevere. God refuses himself to none. Little by little he will increase her courage, and finally she will gain the victory. When we have thoroughly resolved wrote a soul who had understood how God is everything and knew faithfully how to seek God alone. It is only the first steps that count, for from the moment that our well-beloved Savior sees our good will, he does all the rest. I will refuse nothing to Jesus whose love urges me. You know how eloquent is the voice of Jesus. Besides, no one is foolish enough to give up the whole for a part. The love of Jesus, that is the whole, the rest, whatever one may think, is but a negligible quantity, despicable even, in contrast of unique treasure. I am resolved to surrender myself to the love of Christ. I am indifferent to all else. I wish to love him even to folly. Men may break and crush my will and understanding, all that you will, but I do not intend to go to the whole soul good, our divine Jesus. Or rather, I feel that it is he who will not let me go. It is needful that our souls should please Jesus, but no other person. <laughs>